everybody. Um, I'm Sam Clay, um, and I'm here to talk about the art of biofeedback. I worked on two Burning Man art installations. They were both honorarium grants um, back in 2014 and 2016. Um, quick show of hands, is anyone going to Burning Man this year? Got a few people, all right. Has anyone been to Burning Man in either of these years? Then you might remember these two. Uh, they were both out on the playa. Um, so before I get into that, I want to talk about uh, what I do for a living. So I started with software. I'm running a software company right now. It's called News Blur, uh, with a washed out logo up there. It's an RSS newsreader directly competing with Google Reader. Um, it's very likely you may have heard of it, or some of you, I believe, even use it, which, thank you. Um, and so from there, I actually wanted to branch out into hardware. Um, so my first product that I am commercially right about to ship is the Turn Touch. It's this remote that I'm using, actually, to give this presentation. It's home automation. Um, but before I shipped it, I wanted to ship. I knew this was going to take a number of years to build. Um, it was just me working solo. I had to learn how to lay out a PCB, write the firmware, um, make the plastic inside for the button arms, carve out the wood. So I wanted to have a couple successes under my belt before I shipped this, so at least I can tell people, oh, I've shipped something else. Don't worry about the fact that this takes three years to get out the door. Um, so I looked for a Burning Man art installation because I figured it was uh, low stress, uh, which it clearly was not. Um, and it would be kind of easy to just kind of dive into. So uh, I got hooked up to the group that um, initially submitted the Paulson Bloom uh, installation to Burning Man, um, uh, a guy named Rohan Dixit. Uh, he was at the Hacking Consciousness Meetup over at Noisebridge, if anyone's familiar with that meetup. Uh, he was presenting, and uh, I approached him afterwards, and we hit it off, and he told me about his uh, art installation. So they recruited me to work on the electronics. So here you see uh, nothing that I'm involved in, because this is just the steel, the, the, um, the plastic, and uh, the bases. But let me show you how it works. Good, it's muted. Um, so Paulson Bloom is a set of 20 interactive uh, biofeedback uh, lotus flowers. Each one is randomly between 12 and 16 feet tall. Um, the idea is that you'd walk up to it, you'd put your hand on one of these Hamsa hands that's at the base. And I'm going to do that now. And you can see what's about to happen. What it does is it shows your, it reads your pulse, and then it shoots your pulse up the lotus flower. Um, but there's two Hamsa hands per flower. So both you and a partner can then put both of your hands on separate sides, um, it's really hard to make out here, and I kind of apologize for that, but you can kind of see this has one person on it. But over there with the white flower, um, you can see there's actually two heartbeats going up. And that's two different people looking at both of their heartbeats rising. Um, the idea is that if two people are sitting down at this lotus flower, and there are cushions, which is very rare on the playa, uh, one of the reasons our installation was quite popular, um, if you have two people watching each other's heartbeats, something that they cannot control, with a feedback loop of having the, uh, the visual indicator of you and your partner's heartbeat, what ends up happening is as long as you're both in a meditative state uh, of breathing and calm, uh, calm restfulness, eventually your heartbeats start going in, uh, or rather they start um, synchronizing. The truth is they actually go in and out of phase, but at one point they're in phase and you can say your heartbeats are synchronized. Um, so I think, I think you've actually been able to see what's going on here. Um, mostly this is, there's input for 40 different people. And six people can fit on each one of these. Uh, with 20, it's 120, seating for 120 people. So I did all the electronics on it in about the span of three months, part time, while working on Turn Touch and News Blur. So it is entirely possible to do something uh, at this level. But um, as I will show you, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And uh, there's a lot of things that you can fix the next time you do it. So um, first things first, you're out on the desert. You're on the playa, and your budget is practically nil. So we didn't have uh, a budget for, say, wrapping these things up in anything but a Ziploc bag. So they ended up getting dusty. Um, dust is not terrible in the moment. Um, after about a week, which is all they spend out there, uh, they're doing fine. And actually, it rained one of the days. Um, and they did okay. However, when I fished them out of a bin a year later, they were still caked with dust. And dust, it's an alkaline soil, so it ends up corroding metal. 
um, and it will actually desolder components right off the board uh, after about a year. Um, I think it's a bit, a bit of moisture and dust and time. Um, so this is actually a, a photograph taken by a Reuters photographer who was just going around taking uh, fancy shots. This is my girlfriend, Brittany, wearing clothing that she uh, made herself. And essentially my days were filled with hot glue because all of these, uh, all these boards use screw terminals, um, which means they come out all the time. I will never use a screw terminal again as long as I can help it. So I, my days were spent just fixing the, fixing the boards. But I also made the boards by hand. So you can see I ordered uh, all the PCBs right off Oshpark. Um, these are TQFP, uh, and I decided I'm going to make this board. This board is about the size of a stick of gum. Um, the idea is that we were going to put it up the tube so that it would be out of the way. I didn't realize that there would be a pedestal that people kind of sit on, so we had plenty of room, so we didn't need any of that. Um, had I d if I could do it again, I would let all these components breathe. But I did all the soldering on this. Um, here's the hot plate for proof. <laughs> uh, it's not terrible. What I would do differently now is instead of just using the hot plate, I'd use the hot plate at a lower setting because you do end up burning these. And I was in an office with like 20 other engineers, none of whom were working on hardware, none of whom have the sympathy for people who are working on hardware and occasionally burn plastic. So what I would do now is um, have, a, have a, a, a hot plate at a very low temperature and then use a hot air gun to just quickly go over it and seal it. It's like 99% yield. It works incredibly well. It's extremely fast. You end up not burning anything. I would certainly do that differently. But you end up with a complete board, um, all the components neatly lined, out, uh, lined up, uh, which you know, if this were anything else um, would be a problem. But here it doesn't really matter. I just need a little bit of uh, little passive components. Um, and this was the ideal. We would put it in a takeout container. This was literally from my lunch that day. I went around, not Soma, but uh, on Kearney. No one, no business would give me 20 of these. Um, so we ended up using Ziploc bags. Uh, in retrospect, I would not have done that. Let's talk about the sensor. Um, so the sensor that I'm using here is a little different than what I started with. But the idea was I went to Make Magazine. I'm like, how do I build a pulse sensor? This is all passive components. It's two op amps. I think uh, this is about 10,000 uh, in terms of uh, magnitude that's bringing up my pulse. Um, but you can see the problem with this is over there, before I put my finger on it, you have an IR uh, light. And then next to, in the other side, you have an IR receiver. You probably all have these. These are standard components. Um, all this is like you know Joe's capacitors, resistors, a couple easy to access op amps. Um, transistor and then LED. So it actually works very well for being entirely uh, analog um, and inexpensive. The only problem was there's no way this is going to work out on the playa. So we ended up um, going to finding a site called Modern Device. Anyone familiar with Modern Device? They are brilliant. They make a bunch of sensors. We actually used them for our next project as well. They make a pulse sensor that is uh, awesome. Made, this is just proof that I also made the pulse sensors, which are crazy tiny. You can see how small they are. This is Modern Device's um, pulse sensor. And I was able to lift the design, borrow it, uh, change it a little, uh, around a little bit so I could have these curves so it fit the Hamsa hands that were then laser cut. Um, but Essentially, and I turned the six pin into just four pin, just the four pins I needed. Um, it works over SPI, uh, and you get um, the way this chip works. It's a this is a QFN package, which was new for me at the time. It's a ten pin QFN, so four four and then two on each side. Um, and the way that works is it has three IR receivers on it, so we have three lights. One is a visible, and then two IR. If you read the data sheet, um, and if anyone has ever worked with heart rate. Um, and where's Thomas? I know you have. You've done this. Um, red is not the optimal color. If you look at your Apple Watch, you look at your Pebble, it's green. And the reason for that is I think all the IR receivers out there on the market um, work really well with green. You don't get as good of a response with red. However, the project would have looked ugly with a green light. No one wanted it. We wanted a red light. So we dealt with that. But we're getting very little good data off the red. But the two IRs give us plenty of good data, so it's good enough. And then you know the artist is happy because we get a better color. Um, 
So these get installed. You can't, you can't really see here, but there's a red light in here that shows you where to put your hand. It's a Hamsa hand, so as you can see up here, you can kind of get the idea. It's actually covered in um, like this EL wire. There's orange EL wire, so it is lit up. But if you notice something a little different here, you have these normal uh, looking LEDs that you probably recognize. These are your 20 milliamp LEDs that you, know, you can get off the shelf, no problem. You can get them in LED strips, uh, fairly inexpensive. These are five meter strips. They cost $80 at the time. They now cost like 60. Um, these lights, however, are much, much brighter. Those are three watt LEDs. Uh, it's this thing and shield your eyes unless you're really close to me. <laughs> if you're not close to me, this is a three watt LED. This is only one channel, so it's only using one watt. Um, and in case you're wondering, it is very hot. There is a heat sink on the back. Um, I put it in here so you can actually see it. We had nine of these high current LEDs. So the problem with high current LEDs is you have to drive them. You can't just apply power and expect them to light up. Uh, they won't do it. They'll maybe light it for a second, but you either risk burning them out or you're going to have some sort of feedback. So what, what you have to use is SparkFun has this PicoBuck, which is essentially just an, a giant inductor with a little bit of uh, components to, to maintain it. That gives it constant current. But the problem is that is only rated for one of these 3 watt LEDs. So what we did is, because we're only using one channel, we divided it into three LEDs per PicoBuck, three PicoBucks per board. So it's nine LEDs, three picobucks, one board. But to wire all those up, it didn't occur to me that I could use a board for this. I don't know why it didn't, but it didn't. So in order to make that work, what I did was, oh, before I got to that, uh, before I get to that, I had to solder all these by hand. Um, as you can kind of see, there are three leads per side. These are really, really small. I mean, you can kind of see how tiny this is. It's a very, very small LED, even though it's bigger than normal. To solder these without shorting it is nearly impossible. So what ends up happening is they do short, and they short out in the desert. Um, and actually, when you buy them, because they're so cheap, these are about a dollar a piece, these leads right here will short. Um, not intentionally, but it's just the way they come. So you'll have just a little solder bridge over there. And if you don't see it, what ends up happening is you fry your inductor. So soldering all 200 by hand, you can kind of see they have, I have all the colored uh, um, wires here, you have 200 of these things, it's just an absolute mess. Um, and then, this is what it looks like. You have a rat's nest. I use these connectors, these are, um, I got them, I don't remember where, but they now send me uh, uh, every quarter uh, a brochure, not a brochure, a giant magazine full of plastics. Um, but what they do is they, uh, they bridge, wi they're wire to wire connectors. They're very inexpensive, which is the only reason I used it. But you, uh, you push a wire in, and it has like a locking mechanism. So the wire goes through, and it can't go back out. It's sort of like a, um, what? Wego. Wego. W-A-G-O. W-A-G-O, yeah. So they're really inexpensive. I can, you can buy like 100 for like 10 bucks. Um, the problem is they do fail a little bit. And so you're up there looking at this rat's nest of, I think it's like 90 wires, trying to figure out which one is loose. Um, Finally, we get to power. So the whole thing has to be run. Uh, there is no power source out there other than what you buy, bring yourself. So what I did was um, I just looked up the first thing I could, which was uh, deep cycle batteries. This is a marine deep cycle battery. That's why it looks like it belongs on a boat. Um, this is, uh, the material is AGM, which is a gel. What you are more likely uh, used to is lead acid batteries. That's the one that's got liquid in it. If you turn it upside down, it explodes or something. This is a lot safer. It can be kicked. Uh, people who are incredibly high can run their bike into it at full speed, and it's totally fine. This is the size of a cooler, so it weighs 200 pounds. Um, the size of this battery is a 12 volt battery. I think it had 250 amp hours. So if you just do the math on that, this is an enormous battery. We had to charge it every single night. Um, I'll show you the solar panels later. But the whole thing was essentially off grid. We charged the battery. We truck out this 200 pound battery in a tricycle. You first have to wake up the guy who has the tricycle, get him to haul his ass out at, finally at noon, bring it back, get, get the battery charged, then, then repeat every single night. So needless to say, this, didn't act, this installation did not stay on all night because it requires, I think nighttime is like 10 or 11 hours. It would make it like eight of those hours. And then the, just, the failure mode on this is everything turns red. So it still works, but not great. Um, and then this is just a little bit of hardware. If anyone does welding, uh, all, this, all this was just bent steel. Um, but these 
are the bases. So you have these 16 foot steel, uh, extremely heavy uh, flowers, and there's a lot of wind. They catch a lot of wind because they look like essentially sails. So what we did is, this is I think about four feet across, four feet, four feet by four feet. And what, uh, what you do is you auger, uh, you drill a hole into the ground, um, and then you stake it down with rebar. Um, and just this little setup right here, the, uh, we can transport this separately so the pole comes in there. Um, and then you have a very strong structure that is also easy to remove later on. Because once you, anything you put into the ground, you have to be able to take out. Um, so I'm at, uh, this was done by Luke, uh, actually not Luke, but uh, Luke Eisman, but uh, Heather Stewart uh, over at Oakland American Steel Studios. Um, oh, this entire project was built there, actually. Um, and so the end result is you have these uh, beautiful flowers. Um, it, during the daytime, that's me in the middle, but uh, during the daytime it's a respite for people. Um, and they can just kind of come hang out in this beautiful little lotus flower park. Um, and then, if you've been to Burning Man, you know what the next slide is going to look like. This happens. <laughs> and this happens uh, on the regular, maybe every half an hour, every hour. Uh, lasts three or four minutes. It doesn't hurt at all. Um, it's actually kind of pleasant. If any of you grew up in um, you know, states or countries that have snow, it's that feeling, but not cold. And yeah, you're dusty, but you know what you're not doing? If you're dusty, you're not sweating, because the dust just kind of takes care of that somehow. Um, so it's actually kind of pleasant. I look at this, and I think it's like a warm blanket on you. And it's, it's kind of it's fun. You're sitting down. You're, you're having a good time. You're way, way out in the desert. Uh, on Friday, your bike will get stolen. It's not a big deal. All right. So we're halfway through. Um, the second project I worked on is called Grove. Now, if any of you were here about a year and a half ago, uh, I presented during the lightning talks asking for people to help me with Grove. Uh, and I had um, three people from this group come to me and be like, yes, I want to work on that. Steve uh, Lyon, who is somewhere. There he is, way in the back. So Steve, uh, Steve approached me, and he built the main boards on this. Um, and we had a couple other, other people, Hunter Scott and uh, Severin Smith, who also work on the electronics. So Grove is a slightly different. It's the same group of artists, a similar idea, but um, this flower is, is what you see that, that, uh, that woman is breathing into. The idea here is that instead of your heartbeat, which is a passive signal, um, when your heartbeat is going, it's nice. You can see your heartbeat, you can talk, you can actually forget about the fact that your hand is on the Hamsa hand, having your heartbeat measured, and then you can talk to your friends or whatever, and you can kind of have your own time, and you're still interacting with the art. We wanted to turn that upside down. We instead wanted to say, no, you come to our art, you are experiencing our art. You have no say in it. So needless to say, this is a little less popular. Um, but you'd come up, we'd had uh, what we thought were much nicer cushions. Um, we had this flower on a gooseneck, so this does move around. Um, and so you can kind of pass it like a hookah around to all your companions, and you, I don't know if you can tell what you're supposed to do with this, but um, this flower, as you would approach it, there are motion detectors. Um, actually, you know what? I'll start, I'll show the video. So this, this will repeat a few times uh, while we're going. Mm, there is a video. Oh, wait a minute, one more. Oh, that's too bad. There is a video, and I would love to show it to you. There we go. OK, so the idea is this tree is, um, is raining green. The tree is in its, on its own. And as you walk up to it, these passive infrared uh, motion detectors detect that you've walked up to it. And this flower is actually on a motor. So the flower opens up, um, and it changes color, and then it beckons you to breathe into it. Um, as you breathe, the tree fills with your breath this carbon monoxide, this white carbon monoxide that then fills the tree with white and takes over uh, the leaves. Um, the man is burning in the background, if you're wondering why there's a giant fire in the background of this. Um, so this is a lot less contemplative and a lot more active. Uh, you, get, you get all the cool signals that you get from your pulse that, in that it's something that you have to do. You have to have a pulse if you're alive. You have to have a breath. Um, if you're alive. And it's just a, it's a, it's a way to show that we are all alive together. Uh, that, was, that was the idea. Um, you can see that that flower didn't actually open up all that well. And the reason for that is the sensors were built in Boston by uh, Saba uh, Ghoul and New View Studios. 
And they did a great job, but when they sent us the flour, it was a week before Burning Man, and the motors were not strong enough to get over the friction. If we had more time, we would grind down some of the, um, oh, there's no bearings, but we would grind down some of the walls so that it could move with a little more uh, ease. So I think you get a pretty good idea of how Grove works. In Gro with Grove, there's only 10 trees. Um, we decided we would do half as much work, uh, which uh, ended up being the exact same amount of work. So uh, to start, let's deal with the sensor. Um, the way the sensor works, the sensor is embedded inside this flower. So uh, the flower has this, um, if any of you have been to Maker Faire, you've seen uh, any 3D printing company will have demos of a lotus flower that opens up. So this is like the standard lotus flower. It's an open source hardware uh, design. Um, and you can kind of see it's very easy. We took Rolux, which is this material. It's the same material we use on, um, on the leaves on top. It's a translucent plastic. So you can shine a very bright light through it and it diffuses it quite beautifully. You can also laser cut it, which I really like. You have to put masking tape down so you don't have burn scars, but it's very easy to laser cut. So we laser cut all these petals, attach them to the 3D, to the 3D printed structure, and then you see in the middle we have this, uh, this axis that is holding everything up. But the problem is we have uh, a board inside that we want air flow to go through. So in order to do that, um, we have to kind of widen this up. So before we get to that, let's talk about how to run this. What's the microcontroller? If you remember before, I used uh, an MCU. It was the ATmega 328P. I used the TQFP. Had I known, I would have just used an Arduino Uno so they could just swap them. Um, I also used a custom header for programming, uh, uh, the uh, ICSP. I used a custom ICSP that was one-sided because I was trying to save board space, being as clever as I was. You can tell it was my first project. Um, but the problem is when you're programming it out in the field, Flashing firmware takes 20 seconds. Faster on ARM chips, but on an 8-bit chip, it takes 15, 20 seconds. If you slip at all in those 15 seconds, you've just toasted your chip. Um, you have to use a high-voltage programmer to override that. I had, did not account for that. I had TQFPs soldered directly onto the board. There was no chance I was going to be able to switch out the board. I had a few extra boards, but eventually what happened is we went to, this is back when Radio Shack was uh, still uh, alive. Uh, we went to every Radio Shack. Uh, pretty much from here to Reno, uh, there's about six of them, and we bought out all their Arduino Unos, and we bought, out, bought breadboards, and I did the connections to kind of replicate my board. Um, it was miserable. So I was determined not to let that happen this time. So we used everyone's favorite Teensy. Um, and I bet a lot of you realize that's where we were going with this. Uh, we used the Teensy 3.2, uh, Cortex-M4. Love it. You can just, here, here's the board. Um, you. You don't even have programming mistakes because it's just USB, but you can just swap it out, put a new one in. So we had a separate TNC on, uh, in the sensor so it could read its own data because it was trying to read it extremely quickly, and we had another one running all the lights. Um, and TNC 3.6 and 3.5 just came out, like not just, but about a year ago they had a, uh, they had a Kickstarter, went extremely well. Some of the best documentation I've ever seen for a microcontroller came out of Paul who, uh, who wrote all this, I think with some help too. He just writes incredible documentation. Um, if, you, if you are using a Teensy, go back and look at the Kickstarter campaign updates. They're, uh, they're huge and they're, they just cover everything. All right, so the sensor looks like this. This is embedded inside underneath that funnel. It's the size of that funnel. Um, and you see we have air holes, we have two lights, um, and then we have a few, ch uh, a few chips on here. This is the same QFN package of uh, the, it's the same sensor that we used on the pulse controller, uh, on the pulse board, um, but it actually not only can read um, differences in uh, how much light is hitting it, but it can actually do so up to about a foot away. So we embedded it inside thinking that as soon as you put your face over it, we are now registering your breaths. As opposed to having wind just come in and activate it, which it will do, um, we're now activating your breaths because we know someone is in front of it. The problem is that that doesn't work when you're inside a funnel. This funnel is extremely reflective. Even though it is um, translucent, it's extremely reflective. Uh, this is 3D printed. So the light that would come up from those two eyes kind of signaling this is where you breathe into would then reflect down back at the IR receiver and the IR receiver would fire 
And it was, uh, it was horrible because we didn't realize this until they came in and we realized it wouldn't work. So what we did was we went to uh, Fry's, as you do, um, and we bought out all of their ultrasonic cams. So you can see them right here, uh, two ultrasonic sensors. It looks hideous, but it did continue. Um, I don't know what the word is when you see faces in things, but I think you see a face in this. <laughs> and it continues here with the cams. Um, but it worked because then the, we just use ultrasonic on your forehead uh, and then we could tell that you were there and then you could start breathing and it worked great. Um, but the problem is it also made it so that you can't open it, the flower, uh, open and close it, which is fine, it didn't work anyway. Um, all right, the way the sensor works, you've got two uh, resistors right here. Um, it's been a while actually since I've, I've, I've thought about this, but it's called a hot wire anemometer. So anemometer is a wind sensor. If you, you've probably heard of a half cup anemometer, that's those uh, weather vanes that have those half cups that go around in circles. So um, hot wire means that you are, I believe what you're doing is you're applying a voltage uh, to one side of these two resistors. And then you're measuring uh, on an ADC coming back in uh, what the voltage you're getting out. As you breathe on it, essentially as you change the temperature of those resistors, you have slight voltage differences. So I believe they're not straight resistors, I believe they're um, Thermo resistors, is that right? I actually don't remember if that's correct, but they're inexpensive, which is what all that really mattered. Um, and we would measure a little voltage difference, and surprisingly, you can get extremely accurate breath sensing uh, just off those two little resistors um, and a little, little bit of uh, a passive uh, components. Uh, this we also lifted from modern device, so again, I just, I'm sending my next paycheck to them. Um, and then what else did we have? Well, there's a teensy on the back. If you're wondering what all those through holes are, it's the teensy on the back. And then we actually exposed a bunch of pins that we thought we would have to use. We ended up needing to use. Um, but the end result is you show up and you see this and it's a flower. And I don't know about you, but that makes me want to just stick my face right in front of it and start breathing. There are no instructions on any of our art. We don't tell you what to do. You just have to kind of figure it out. So the problem is when we went to Fry's, we got all these uh, ultrasonic sensors. Um, this is well after we had the boards. We were on our way to Burning Man. So you do as anyone who's putting art on at Burning Man does, and you solder on Playa. <laughs> so we had an assembly line of uh, 10 of these. Uh, this is Severin. Um, and we just soldered it. We, uh, we had a little portable AC inverter, so we could plug in soldering irons. I don't know if anyone has used a butane portable soldering iron. I'm very well uh, versed in how those work now. They are great, but you have to constantly fill them with butane. They do go out, especially in the wind, but they work and they're great. Um, never ever use an electric portable soldering iron unless you don't care about soldering. If you just want a hot stick to poke people with. Um, butane works. It's a little scary, but it does work. But the best is if you can get, you know, if you can just bring your, uh, your iron from home and you don't care about ply dust, just eating away at it. All right, here's the board. Um, the designer of this sitting in the back. Um, so I think the, there's a few interesting things about this. Um, one is, if you remember from the old board, we had um, a bunch of screw terminals. This time, we tried to fix that mistake. Screw terminals, not only are they completely unreliable and they come undone, someone has to screw every single one of those in, and it's a pain. I actually just biked with all this stuff here, and uh, two or three, three of the wires came out of this. And I had it all set up in my office, put it in my bag, biked here, got here, wires are gone. So what we did was we switched to this. This is called MTA 100. It's a wire to board connector. Screw terminals cost about a dollar a piece, I believe, for like a three pin header. Um, these are like a third or a quarter of that price. Um, you have to buy both sides. You have to buy the male and the female, but these are incredibly easy. This is just a standard uh, p uh, 0 0.1 inch pitch. Um, they have orientation, so that white bar right there is orientation. If you don't want it, you don't have to. You can buy it with orientation or not. But this means that later on when your art starts traveling the world, people who are not you, who don't know how this works, can just plug it in and not make a mistake. The problem with that uh, is that this it's sort of like plastic injection molding. If you 3D print something, your per unit cost relatively high versus the injection molding, which is very, very low, your tooling cost is really high. This is $300 worth of crimping. Um, this is 150 for the body, 
and this is 150 for the head. And the head is specific to the exact size of MTA100 connector. Um, you put a single wire in, you crimp it, and it, it automatically advances. It's great, but that has a yield of about 80%, which is incredibly, incredibly low. Because that means four out of every five wires you crimp works. That last one doesn't work. You don't know this until everything's up. And then you go back and you recrimp everything. And then of that one out of five that doesn't work, four out of those don't work, and one still doesn't work. So it's not a panacea. If anyone has inexpensive wired board connectors, please talk to me afterwards. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out on this, um, if you're wondering what this is, I think Steve originally put in, this by the way is a fuse, every board should have one. Um, he originally had, I think, a transistor or something to uh, be able to shut off the board um, remotely and be able to turn it back on. Uh, but the problem was, I, I think, when we started running it, um, something didn't work about it. This is the more interesting piece, though. Um, what this allows us to do is, when you're, when you're working on an art project with, uh, with artists, they're going to change their minds, especially when the art is up. And there's no way to really put the art up because it costs a lot of money to do that um, and time. So you, can, you get to do it once. So we didn't know exactly uh, whether Shiloh uh, wanted to have all the LED strips be individual and all do the same, or rather all individually and have different movements or all be the same. So we had uh, jumpers that could essentially tie these four together. And what we have here are the three pin um, these are, uh, oh, I forget what the, it's the RGB LED, it's like 2812B, that's the one. Yeah, 20, the 2812Bs. These two pins are for voltage drop. When you have a long five meter cable, we ran a cable back, uh, just the power on ground, back to the board. And then our voltage drop, instead of being linear down, it formed a V. But you can't really tell that it's a V because we don't light every light on at the same time. It's not terrible. But without that, you would be able to tell. Um, so this just allowed us to change all that wiring on the fly. The firmware was already built to handle both cases. But we were knew we wouldn't be able to change the firmware. And running four of these individually may have been too much on the firmware. We weren't really sure. So with that, it was just easier to, to have jumpers be able to change it last minute. Finally, um, the, uh, the high current LEDs. You'll notice these are a little different. These have their leads on the corners, uh, which is so much better. When you have them on the corners, you can then farm out soldering. You can teach people how to solder and then farm out the work. And that's so much better than having to do it all yourself. Um, these cost the same. It was just two years later. So maybe they didn't have them back then. Next, this is my favorite. This is a, what we call a dispatcher board. This is that rat's nest in a board. There is a crucial difference, though, and that's right here. This is a spy DAC. So this 12-pin monstrosity here is four pins of power, four pins of ground, because we're running, oh god, I don't even know, three watts times uh, 12. So this is, this is a lot of power going up. Uh, and these are 22 gauge wires. So we have a bunch of, uh, of wires. But then if we wanted to control all these individually, it's too many to send up their um, the, the other problem is to control picobucks, you have to, it's an analog signal, um, and the analog controls the brightness. So instead of PWMing it digitally, you use an analog signal. But the problem is you can't send the analog signal 20 feet uh, at 5 volt and expect it to stay, uh, and ex expect these to be able to read it. So what we ended up doing was putting in a spy DAC, which allows us to issue spy, digital spy, um, and then it just converted to analog, and it's a passive component. It was super easy. There's no chip on there that does anything. Um, I am, this is someone who actually studied double E, uh, knew to put that on there. Um, and then these right here, fuses. Uh, if there were any LEDs that had a problem, that fuse right there, a resettable fuse, took care of it. I have no idea if any of them didn't work. We had hundreds up there. But it didn't matter, because we had fuses. Jesus, how we use a lot of fuses now. Um, now we get to the batteries. I want to do the battery situation a little better this time. Uh, as opposed to having a giant heavyweight battery, I actually really wanted to optimize for having a bunch of different, uh, rather, a bunch of smaller batteries. So I wrote up uh, a little chart. I did dollars per watt hour as my uh, sort. And then I just looked up every single battery I could find, um, sort it. You'll see the difference. It's almost twice as expensive if you use, there's no difference between this 200 amp hour and this what, 220 amp hour. The material is the same. 
Uh, the voltage is the same. It's just made by different companies. Um, so it really pays to shop around. And then you don't even notice that they're all that different until you actually do the dollars per watt hour calculation. Um, and so we just chose the second from the top, which was six volt. That way what we could do is run, um, we put three of them in series to make it 18 volt. That way the board runs at 12 volt. Uh, we did 18 volt because you're going to have voltage drop. It was all DC cabling. We wanted no generator, no AC. So because we had DC cabling, I think every 10 feet you're going to lose a volt. I think that's roughly correct. Um, so 18 volts means it's like the far flowers, it's like 13 volts by the time it gets there. We buck that down to 12, it's no problem. Uh, finally, we um, power them with uh, solar panels. This is, these are 300 watt solar panels. There's seven of them, so that's a two kilowatt array. That guy who, uh, that's Luke Eisman, he has no shirt on. Um, he never has a shirt on. He lives in Oakland, off grid, uh, and you're looking at, we had ice cream in that truck running all the time. We just had freaking ice cream. Um, we have a freezer. The problem with having a freezer is that it takes a lot of power, um, <laughs> and all the batteries were charging. And peak power consumption is during the day when the batteries are charging, so the batteries didn't charge that well. Uh, my recommendation next time is don't run your ice cream freezer chest on the same power source as your art installation batteries. Um, and of course, you can't avoid it. There's still firmware debugging out on the Playa. You have, uh, this is my laptop, I had to replace the keyboard, it cost $300. There's no way around it. You're just gonna screw up your, your computer. Um, then it got stolen it, when my office got uh, robbed, and I, it's not my problem anymore. What, one more thing. Um, one of the things you don't realize when you're starting the project is that you, th this is, this is a, a small scale uh, example of the leaf. We had demoed this leaf, we were like, oh this looks great, it's going to be easy to put on, I could put two on at once, it's going to be real, real trivial to get this thing up there. Um, but then you make it, and it's big, and suddenly it's not so easy to put on anymore. Um, and you have to transport these. Uh, this is all laser cut. This is um, very, I think, like eighth inch or sixteenth inch steel. It's probably sixteenth inch steel. This is very, very sharp. We ended, and they're hanging down at eye level. We ended up calling these sky razors. Um, <laughs> and these go up on the trees. So you have to, you have to get them up there, bolt them in. Um, and you see this ladder it has fallen because um, Karina, one, one of our, uh, our artists um, and helpers, was up there putting it in. A wind gust took her out. She's, this is like a you know, eight foot ladder. She was standing at the top. Wind gust took her out. And you think about how the wind gust comes, your center of gravity falls to the ground. Then the ladder, which is essentially connected to you, has the same center of gravity, then falls right on top of you and it hit her right here in the cheek. Thank God, here, because anywhere else would have been horrible, but she just powered through it. This is Shiloh uh, Shib Suleiman. She's the, um, the leader, the artist who runs everything. Um, she wrote the honorarium. Uh, absolutely brilliant. I would be, love to work with her again. And then you have another art installation uh, that people are really happy to uh, attend during the day, as you see here. We, this is late in, later during the day, so we actually turn the lights on so you can kind of enjoy it uh, during the day. Um, and of course, you already know what happens if you're out on the playa during the day. You get a dust storm. And that's it. So thank you for, uh, for listening. Do we have, it's 37 minutes. Do we have time for questions? Anyone have any questions? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, screw so in my book, screw terminals suffer from multiple issues, one of which is price. They're not cheap. It's cheaper to use something else that has, has a higher initial cost, like the MTA 100 crimper. Um, they, they still, they, like when I bought all the screw terminals, and you saw on this board, there's like eight screw terminals. That's $8, 20 boards. You know, the budget was only so big. Um, other than that, I think I know how to use a screw terminal. I would still lose wires all the time. Um, people would sit on it, the board would sometimes pull a little bit, they would come out. 
I, it was the bane of my existence the entire week. I just had to deal with horrible, horrible screw terminal issues. Uh, the other thing is, um, with screw terminals, you have to put the wires in in the right order. And when you have helpers, you, you print out a color copy to show this is the, the order of the wires. You maybe write it on the board, but it's really hard to get right. So this is just, you snap in, it's 80%, but maybe, maybe there's a better way to crimp them. Again, I would love to hear if anyone has wired a board that's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have made more sense if we crimped everything in my office. We crimped everything on Playa. Well, because it's free labor. On Playa, you have 20 people who want to help because they haven't done anything else and they want to act like they're, they're helping. So you give them work to do and they do a 80% yield rate. So that's the first time it occurred to me to use an email list and just like broadcast, I need this, this help. It, it's not in my nature to ask for help, so I didn't, I didn't, it didn't occur to me. And it, it, what it more occurred to me is to go to Radio Shack, buy the equivalent of everything, and then return them afterwards if we didn't use them. Um, and we used a few of them. So. Oh, yeah. We didn't use Ziploc bags. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, the what? The dust problem? We washed them um, when they came back. So I just made sure everything got washed. I use the formal coating if it's not there. Use what? The formal coating, spray it. Oh, yeah. So um, that actually, Luke, the shirtless guy, wanted me to do that. And I refused. Because he, uh, I mean, it covers everything. So all the inscriptions on the board are gone. I mean, you're essentially making it permanent. Um, and I don't want that. I mean, this installation has to travel. So I want to be able to see the board. I'm also like, I'm, you know, I didn't design the board, but I'm so proud of it. And I wanted people to see that this board has very, you know, silk screen on there. And I didn't want to just like make it permanent. Um, hot glue was something we used in the, um, the screw terminals. We just hot glued everything. And that was great until we realized that some of the wires were wrong. So we didn't hot glue after we pulled everything out. There's only so much time, you know? Did you have, I mean, was there any sort of non conductive potting that people used on sort of boards that were not going to generate a fair amount of heat such that they could fully pot it that you saw while you were out there? Um, well, I didn't see anyone else's boards. Ours were hidden, and I would have loved to. I actually was, we, you know, drank a little bit one night and then found the other lotus flowers on the playa. We drank quite a bit. And then we started digging and trying to figure out how they were made. And then someone came and yelled at us, and we ran away. Um, so I don't know. Again, the, this is the stresses you're working under. They're not always the best. You're not always working in the, with the, the best mind. Um, Thomas, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, so can you talk about how the budget allocation went? Because it seems like you were struggling to pay for like $5 plastic rock for each thing. But you had a thousand watts of solar panels. Yeah. It was, it was the time. So the solar panels were free. He lives off grid. He had them. So that's why we, ha we got to use them. It was about time, not money. Um, I probably could have looked up plastic, but I mean, I had other things to do. And, you know, at the end of the day, I had all these other things that I was working on. And then the plastic for the housing, it's just like, oh, maybe someone else will deal with it. Or we'll just like, it'll be magic and it'll just work at the end. And I assumed it would. And the thing is, it did work. It's just our boards were naked. There's no enclosures. The other problem with those takeout containers, you had to drill holes in them and run all the wires through them. And that was like, that was a bridge too far for people. <laughs> no one wanted to do it. Uh, last yeah, last question. Uh, how much time did you work on this board? What was the time scale? So um, I spoke to Rohan in May, uh, Burning Man's the end of August. So it's about, what, three months? Um, three months. And then I went out to the playa a week early um, to, uh, 
I, I'll say one more thing, actually. Um, Steve had this idea as we were cleaning up uh, and not, say, three months before. But um, his idea was that what we could have done on the new board, what we should have done is put a, uh, a, a current um, measure, uh, a current measurement, uh, what's an ammeter, an ammeter, um, on the board. And what it would have done is a, a power on self-test, where it turns everything on and individually checks to see if current is running. And if it's not, switch a light or something, just so that we could quickly look at it and see, is, is it green, is it all greens? That would have cost nothing. It would have been easy to do in firmware. Um, we just didn't occur to us. So I would definitely do that differently as well. All right? And um, it, when, I'll, I'll leave this up here. I'll, I'll probably take that down so it doesn't stare uh, the presenter. But you can come up here, and you can actually see your, your pulse and kind of see how it's looking. Um, and two people can do it, so you, know, you can see you know, different pulses. It should look the same, but um, it'll take a second. In bright light, because it's measuring light, it doesn't work perfectly well. Move in the back? Yeah, I'll just have to plug it back in. All right, all right, well, thank you.